Welcome to the Gospel According to Star Trek podcast. I'm Kevin C. Nice, and I'm flying solo today, but I have with me our special guest, David Atwell from Real World Theology. David and I will be talking about Real World Theology's annual Star Trek tribute, Trek Timber, which is going on right now. It's going to be coming up right after we discuss some Star Trek news and the latest episode of Lower Decks here on episode three, Talking Trek Timber. Stick around. All right. Well, here we are again. Uh, this is episode three. And uh, sadly, my, my cohort, my, my right arm, my, my first officer, my other brain, uh, and, and more importantly, my clock watcher, uh, Tim Van Orden, is not here. <laughs> um, but I do have uh, David Atwell here with me from Real World Theology. Hello. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you for being here, David. I'm, I'm really excited that you're here. I've known David for a few years, uh, done some writing uh, for him and for Real World Theology, which you can find on uh, the Gospel According to Star Trek website and uh, kevincinis.com. Um, and on Real World Theology, strangely enough. Um, That's right. There'll, there'll be links to all that down below. Yeah, actually, uh, I was just looking it up. The first time you wrote for me, uh, the article mm -hmm. went up on September 9th of uh, the year 2017. And uh, oh. you were writing about the best of both worlds, part one and two for Check September. It out. And yeah. this is, this is going to be dropping on September 7th. So it's there like, it's, it's almost our, our third anniversary. That's, That's right. Amazing. I feel so special. <laughs> That's fantastic. Well, uh, so Star Trek news, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll get more with David in, in just a little bit. We're going to learn all about what he does. And until then, he's going to be this uh, wonderful disembodied voice for you to listen to along <laughs> with mine. Um, as we talk about Star Trek news, there are, you know, every week I kind of wonder, is there going to be enough Star Trek news to do a Star Trek news seg segment? <laughs> and this week is another one of those weeks where I'm like, can we cover everything that I found in this one <laughs> segment? Um, the first thing that I was going to talk about was Star Trek Discovery, mm -hmm. um, which, you know, of course, we're doing our exploration of right now uh, on the podcast we just started last episode. Um, Star Trek Discovery Season 1 is going to air on actual CBS. Yeah. Uh, the, first time, the first time we've had any Star Trek, or any new Star Trek, rather, on the air since Enterprise went off the air, right? Uh, no, because Star Trek Discovery actually premiered on the air. Oh, that's right. That's right. Yeah. 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 We were talking about that last episode, the, my excitement at enjoying watching a Star Trek premiere for the uh -huh. first time. So I'm right. really interested to see how this works. I notice, well, it says at 10 PM, but I'm not sure what, um, it's probably Pacific time based on when the, where the article uh, takes. Oh, let's see. Let's see. Uh, 10 to 11 PM Eastern Pacific. So um, I'm guessing, I, I'm guessing, I don't know how they're going to do it because because Star Trek Discovery is TVMA. Right. I mean, the first few episodes are probably going to be fine to air as is. I don't remember anything really questionable until later on in the season. But yeah, it, it seems like one of those things where they could probably edit it down. They probably can. And, you know, of course, the main thing I think of those first couple of ex episodes is the violence. Right. Um, That's true. You know, I was I was talking last time about the puddles of people. Um, yeah. and I don't know how much of that you can, show. of course they show all kinds of stuff on, on primetime television now in terms of violence and gore. Um, so I don't know. Yeah. Um, but it's going to be great to have Star Trek on TV again, I think. Yeah, for sure. And this is going to be season one, right? Just season one. Yeah. Yeah. So it's a, it's a lead into season three because we're, you know, one of the impetuses for beginning this podcast was that we have this 23 weeks of Star Trek on CBS mm -hmm. All Access and so on October 15th, season one is going, season three is going to launch of Star Trek Discovery. And um, we thought that'd be a good time to start doing this. And so it's really to try to, I think, get eyeballs on season three. And it is such a different world right now with regard to Star Trek. There's so much going on. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah. just even, even just four years ago, it was so different. Oh, absolutely. I was thinking just the other day that in three years, we have gotten, if you count short treks, Mm -hmm. We've gotten four new Star Treks in three yep. years. And uh, if, you, if you look at all of the new Star Trek that comes out uh, in the calendar year 2020, none of it takes place before Voyager. So you've got, you know, season one of Picard, which takes place a couple years, I think maybe a couple of decades after Voyager. Right. And then you've got Lower Decks season one, which takes place a couple of years after Voyager. And then you've got uh, season three of Discovery, which takes place a couple of centuries after Voyager. I think that's really interesting. You know, after all of these years of us 
Star Trek fans complaining about how everything's a prequel, uh, they're finally you know, saying, okay, well, no prequels anymore at all. <laughs> Fine, we're taking your prequels away. So there, right. <laughs> see how you like it. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, no, it's great. I'm, I'm excited. I'm, I'm always excited. I don't care. I'm as interested, honestly, about Star Trek stories that take place in Star Trek's past as yep. I am about stories that take place in Star Trek's future. I agree. Which is another thing that um, I want to mention uh, th that leads us to our, our next point. You talk about all this Star Trek taking place in the future. There is some exciting Star Trek that is happening. You know, we're coming up on Star Trek Day mm -hmm. um, on, on the 8th, which is the day after this, this episode will drop. And uh, on that day will be released a fan film called Star Trek First Frontier. Interesting. And this is a film that excites me personally because it's about Robert and Sarah April. Interesting. And yeah. So it's early days of, of Enterprise. And of course, you know, I mean, none of it's going to be connected with, with you know, uh, with canon the way we, we, we might like. But um, Right, sure. It, it's been in the making for for a number of years and it looks to be like a really good you know project and uh, huh. yeah yeah there, there's gonna be there are gonna be some watch parties going on i think with some friends of mine that sounds like a lot of fun and i mean we've got um strange new worlds coming up of course that that sort of promises another you know enterprise before kirk uh feel and i, I have a feeling that that's going to be you know, we're, we're talking, if we are talking about April now, uh, we're, we're going to basically have seen everything uh, from the uh, beginning of the Enterprise through its refit, through its destruction. And that's going to be uh, really interesting to be able to follow the entire legacy of that ship that sort of started yeah. it all. Yeah, that's going to be, that's going to be fantastic. You know, years ago, there was a comic book um, called uh, Star Trek Early Voyages, mm -hmm. and it was a direct sequel to The Cage. And oh, okay. picked up picked up following the the crew of the of the Enterprise under Pike, imagining some new crew members who, that we didn't get to see in the episode, and and um, that was pretty exciting. IDW put out a, a Star Trek Omnibus two, I think it was. They put out a, a collection of that series. So that okay, cool. I'm gonna have to check that down. That that sounds great. Yeah, yeah, it's really cool. Um, Star Trek Early Voyages, very cool stuff. We'll put a link to that in the description, I guess, too. Um, okay, so <laughs> um, Star Trek Day again. Uh, this is uh, September eighth, Monday. Uh, no, Tuesday, Tuesday, the day after you get to, you're listening to this. So that's tomorrow. If you're listening to this now, CBS All Access is doing what, what has been referred by, I think Alex Kurtzman has been referred to as the first canon Star Trek day. Um, <laughs> start, I remember in 2016 on the 50th anniversary on, on Star Trek day on, on, on the September 8th, I was on the radio in the UK. Um, I wasn't in the UK. I was on the radio in the UK. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but um, on Premier Christian Radio, and it's on my it's on my website, kevinsinis.com slash media. Um, but uh, and in that <laughs> interview, the host asked me, she's like, so happy Star Trek Day. And she's like, what are you doing to celebrate Star Trek Day? And you can hear in the interview, I mean, I can hear that I'm like completely at a loss. <laughs> I'm like, there's no codified celebration for this. We don't. Right. You know, we don't kill the fatted targ and like right. you know roast it with our hand phasers. <laughs> I mean, if you could find one, uh, <laughs> you could find but, one. <laughs> but everyone knows that a targ is best served raw, right? Well, but, that's true. That's true. But I mean, come on, we're we're, we're not all Klingons, right? Um, <laughs> I think it's kind of funny that they're uh, that they're actually celebrating Star Trek Day this year. They didn't celebrate it for the fiftieth, but apparently the fifty fourth. That's uh, that's worth celebrating. Uh, you know, uh, that's that's how it goes with Star. But you. Know, they didn't they didn't celebrate star trek day that's true there wasn't there wasn't a, a an official codified like star trek day but i mean there was a lot surrounding the 50th anniversary there was still a lot of, of celebrations um you had you had the history channel did the did the two-part documentary thing and mm -hmm. you had um the the new abrams film came out right uh, the beyond, star trek yeah. beyond which was gorgeous yeah. it was fantastic um, yeah and oh and also um that year was the release of of this uh, of a special 50th anniversary book which i think is probably the best commemoration of star hmm. trek's 50th anniversary that was published um i just can't think of the name of it um i just think it's interesting how uh how how much has changed because you know like like we were talking about before there's so much more star trek this year but also like paramount and cbs are back together again and and in at the 50th anniversary they weren't and so yeah there wasn't really any way for them to do a, a unified celebration I like how you just blew past my attempt at a joke there. See, Tim would have gotten that because the book I'm talking about is mine. 
<laughs> See, I was trying to cover for you so that you could uh, look up the name of it. I didn't think about. <laughs> I played that so well. You just took me literally. <laughs> yep, yep. Uh, uh, yeah. Oh, boy. But yeah, uh, no, you're right. I mean, things have changed a lot. And I think and I think uh, people have talked about Star Trek being in chaos and different things. We talked about that on the first episode. That yeah. Things feel a little scattered and weird because there's so much stuff happening. But, you know, at the same time, I still go back to that, 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 it's, that this is probably the best time to be a Trekkie, at least since the 25th anniversary. That this, mm-hmm. is, just, this is just a great time to be a Trekkie. And... Um, and like you said, you know, so it's the 54th anniversary when we when we have the codified Star Trek, uh, Star Trek Day. You know, so what? I mean, I have a T-shirt my parents gave me that has a big 53 on it <laughs> for the 54th, 53rd anniversary of Star Trek. It's got all the cast members on it and everything. And I'm like, I don't have a 50th anniversary shirt, but doggone it, I've got a 53rd anniversary shirt. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it just well, all numbers are arbitrary anyway, right? Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> Uh, so hey, you know we can do it anytime. It's great, but the the check out the fifty the the uh, the Star Trek Day thing on uh, on CBS All Access. They say it's free, so I don't know if you don't have to have a CBS All Access account or what. But go to <laughs> Star Trek dot com slash day again. Link in the description um, and learn all about it. It's twenty four hours of programming. They're going to have uh, curated um, Star Trek marathons and also panels with cast members from every single well from nine they say from nine series it's really from every series because there are 10 series counting um counting strange new worlds they have a strange new worlds panel oh wow and they really have a panel from from every single one of those because uh patrick stewart and jonathan frakes are there representing both tng and picard and then george takei is doing the tos panel with rod roddenberry and tk was also on the star trek the animated series so that really uh-huh. actually covers everything except huh. the, the kelvin timeline so yeah um it's gonna be really cool there's a lot there's a lot of the shows have most of their casts on there or, or a big a big healthy portion of their casts on on their panels so yeah it's good stuff that's fantastic yeah it. yeah so um one last piece of of star trek news are you ready for it go for it <laughs> this uh this one is uh one that i i uh, was sent to me just in the last couple days by at least three separate people um if not four uh have have come to me with this one um because and it's and it's it's getting a lot of it's getting a lot of attention right now and it's uh it's an announcement about season three mm-hmm. um, of discovery of discovery yeah and it's it's this casting announcement so it's blue del barrio and ian alexander who are the first non-binary, uh, respectively, the first non-binary and transgender uh, actors and, well, actors, I don't know, but, but, but characters, uh, transgender non-binary characters in Star Trek history. Glad actually did an interview with Blue Del Barrio. Um, that's, where I, that's where I learned about this because I, that was what was tweeted out that was sent to me, um, mm-hmm. was the interview with Blue. And um, they are a, uh, a, not a brand new actor, but this is kind of their first big gig. Yeah. <laughs> and it's like, it's cool reading the enthusiasm there. You know, it's, it's, it's all about, you know, getting this, getting this first big gig and everything. You can tell you're reading the words of this excited young person who's never done anything like this before. Right. <laughs> and, is, and is really jazzed about it. Um, what, what kind of, what kind of uh, conversations have you seen going on about this? I, I've seen them go both ways. I mean, not as much, thankfully, as I was afraid was going to happen, but a lot of backlash from the Christian fans and more conservative fans of mm-hmm. Star Trek and right. uh, all the all the other stuff that you just sort of hear whenever this sort of thing comes out, uh, which, you know, like I said, I'm, I'm just glad that there was less of it than I expected there to be. I, I, I want to say that I'm always very aware when I'm when I'm writing and speaking in this realm that I, my audience can be any any range of Christians all the way from uh, not understanding and not believing in and not supporting in any way um, uh, queer people, you know, or, or, or believing that that's sinful and, and what have you all the way to actually being mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, a gay, a bi, a transgender, a, a non-binary person. So um, I'm definitely never here to take sides and and that's how I try to treat most of the more sensitive theological and 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 um, doctrinal topics that we might cover. 
um, both in the books and in podcasts and blogs and what have you. I do want to say that I think it's, um, I don't know, there, there, there's some reaction that I see from, from certain Star Trek fans who get angry about the inclusion maybe of, uh, and we're going to talk more about like Culver and Stamets and things like that as we get into, and, and Jet Reno as we get into uh, Discovery on the podcast. Mm -hmm. um, but a lot of people who seem kind of shocked by it, <laughs> upset. And right. I just kind of want to say, you know, Star Trek is a progressive show. Like it right. always has been. We can look back mm -hmm. at the original series and it seems, um, you know, I just kind of like, wow, you're, you're kind of, you have a really low view of women, <laughs> you know, <laughs> or, or right. you know, things like that. But in its time, you know, yeah. in its moment in history, it was a very progressive show and it always has been. Yeah. So this is something I've been expecting for a very long time. And uh, it's, it's something that Gene very much wanted in Next Generation. Um, right. You know, that's, that's where you, you, know, you see the, there, there are a few shots of the men wearing skirts, you know, in, in mm -hmm. early, episode, early seasons of TNG. And, uh, you know, he wanted to have, you know, you know gay couples, you know, in, in the background and stuff in 10-4, which is about as much as you could do in 1989 right. or whenever he suggested yeah. it. Um, but, you know, on television. Um, but, you know, things, things have changed, haven't they? Yeah. And I mean, you know, regardless of what you think about it, regardless of like your, your convictions theologically and, and what you believe the Bible says about this sort of thing, um, these people exist, right? And, and yep. this is, my wife actually made a point uh, when she heard about this, you know, talking about, you know, if we, if we want to love our neighbor, which the Bible says that we have to do, how can we love our neighbor well if we aren't willing to listen to their story? In order to love them well, we have to know what they're going through. Um, and I think that we forget that a lot of times. I personally have no problem with this casting at all. Mm -hmm. I think that it's just uh, yet another expression of how Star Trek is and has always reflected our culture that we find ourselves in. And um, I think that that's in the DNA of this show basically you know i i appreciate you being here and giving your thoughts because tim and i are going to talk more on this sort of thing because we have to when you're talking about discovery and i think that's one of the great mm -hmm. things about discovery including things that make people uncomfortable whether it's this area or other areas you know i talked uh, last week about uh when star trek gets too sexy or when star trek gets too violent or when star trek swears too much you know star trek fans get upset mm -hmm. and those are all things that we get to talk about in discovery um, and so I actually always welcome any kind of media that makes people uncomfortable. Yeah, um, that's what it's supposed to do. I appreciate that, that Star Trek continues to, um, to both welcome people in and also uh, in that welcoming um, make some people uncomfortable. Um, I think that's a good thing. Yeah, for sure. Okay, so let's get into uh, Lower Decks real quickly because new Star Trek is happening and, and we're talking about Star Trek that hasn't even happened yet. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, episode five of Lower Decks, mm -hmm. Cupid's Errant Arrow. Yeah. Um, how did you feel about that? Uh, I thought it was pretty good. It, I, don't, I really liked Moist Vessel and I really liked Envoys and I think those are still my two favorite. Uh, but I thought mm -hmm. this one was pretty good. It had a really, really good Star Trek-y premise uh, and it explored character uh, a lot more than it was trying to make jokes and stuff mm -hmm. and i feel like um i feel like that was something that that uh, the orville when it started doing that um really started to take off as a show for me was when mm -hmm. it started exploring good sci-fi premises premises and uh going more to the character than trying to just make the cheap joke uh yeah. and I, I think that's what that's what this is doing and and honestly uh you you were talking i think it was in the last episode about how um, this isn't the best uh, Star Trek, best new Star Trek show in decades. And I agree right. with that, by the way. Uh, I don't think this is the best Star Trek, best new Star Trek show in decades. But I do think this might be the strongest first season for a Star Trek, episode, or Star Trek series in decades. I'm going to have to disagree with you on that, but that's okay. Okay. All right. <laughs> but that's that is only because of the the severe level to which i hated the first episode and how much <laughs> i loved the first seasons of discovery and picard well, well how about how about the the quickest turnaround between that sort of first season slump and uh and the, <laughs> and where it, when it actually gets good that, that might be more like what i was talking about because like, uh i well, thought it was a turnaround from like episode one to episode two from like terrible to great. Uh, yes. And I thought, and that's really quick compared to like Next Generation took it almost 
a season and a half to really get good. And, uh, you know, um, Deep Space Nine well, is about a season or so. And then there was obviously in both of those se series, there was good episodes peppered here and there. But I think with, uh, with Lower Decks, I feel like they really found their footing in episode two. And, yeah. uh, and I was really just impressed. It was like getting the whole like first season slump done in one episode, which is you <laughs> know, like everything else in this, in this uh, series, surprisingly efficient. Right. Um, <laughs> very quick. <laughs> very quick. Whiplash. Um, but, inducing I, almost. But, but I will also say that I, I, you know, a lot of people say exactly what you're saying that it took, you know, two or three seasons or a season and a half or whatever for Deep Space Nine or, or, or uh, TNG to really come together. I love early TNG. Um, there are certain episodes that, and certain moments, you know, code of honor. Um, there are certain, oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> certain episodes and certain moments that don't work, you know, and you can say, well, you know, we're still figuring it out. But I, there's a lot of that stuff I really love, you know, and um, for me, Deep Space Nine, uh, just stem to stern, I love that whole series. Um, uh, I have maybe one episode that I'm just like, yeah, that didn't work. But <laughs> I, I, you know, I love the whole series. So, but, but, I, but I do understand. Stronger at the end though, right? I, yo, yeah. I mean, it, it grows up. It matures so sure. much over, over the course of the series. But the thing is, it generally takes time to do that no yeah, matter what. For sure. And so it's not as though the early episodes are poorer. The early episodes are just earlier. Right, you know, even with discovery, when you when you jump in and production values are so high, you mm -hmm. know, and everything's so intense and cool and it's awesome and you love it, still you can see how the series gets more seasoned and more mm -hmm. interesting and more complex as you get through the second season. Yeah, for um, sure. And that's just the nature of serialized storytelling, I think. Yeah. Um, so I don't, I, I, I've, I've never held anything against early seasons of, now I will hold something against uh, late episodes of TNG like Sub Rosa and Masks because Fair. honestly people, we should know better by now. Right. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's the seventh season. I mean, but maybe you're getting tired. I understand, you know. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I, I do actually have a hot take about Moist Vessel. That oh, yeah. Moist Vessel is what Masks should have been. Moist Vessel is what Masks should have been. Tell me that. Tell me. Okay. Explain that to me. So masks is the one where the whole enterprise just starts transforming into something else, right? The world around them changes. The familiar thing changes. And even people are sort of put together in ways where they have to uh, learn how to work together in, in new and in different ways because they're not the people that they are, uh, are sort of expected to be. Right. And Moist Vessel was exactly that <laughs> you know the world around them is changing <laughs> and they're forced to deal with each other people in the the show are forced to deal with each other in new and different ways and ways that they've never had to deal with each other before and sort of confront um big uh problems in their uh philosophy and and personality and uh i, I felt like the the way that moist vessel dealt with that was way more efficient i mean way shorter of course but also way less cringy uh <laughs> Well, that's good. I, I yeah, boy, I never would have I would never would have made that connection. So this is this is why it's good to have somebody to talk to on this thing and not just be talking to myself all the time. Happy to be here. <laughs> <laughs> and and by the way, I, I also want to say it's 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 it, it just makes me feel good as a host to have a guest on who has watched my episodes or listens to my episodes before. <laughs> knows my knows my work like that. That's that's very that's very cool because I've never been on anybody's show. I think where I had listened to their previous episodes. So. <laughs> I'll keep that in mind so, if you're ever on uh, one of my podcasts. Right. <laughs> You'll be like, so, Kevin, what'd you think of the last episode? And I'll be like, oh, duh. duh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Um, so, yeah, this, this episode was really good. I, I love um, that it gave, uh, you know, it, it kept us guessing as to what was what and who was who and who was right and who was wrong, you know, in, in, mm -hmm. in the situation with, with Boimler and, uh, and Mariner and the other lady, I can't remember her name. Um, see, I should have all these character names written down for me like a professional uh, when I do these episodes, <laughs> but. Uh, uh, her name okay. is Barbara Brinson. Lieutenant fine, Brinson. fine, okay. <laughs> Thank you, yeah. So Barbara, yeah, so Barbara, right. Um, and which I think is great that they're both like BB alliterative names names uh -huh. um, yep um brad boimler and, and barbara Br brinson as you said i didn't even notice until yeah. i was looking at the at the memory alpha page about it it's like it's like lois lang lois lane and lana lang and lex uh -huh. luther and all that right. kind of stuff yeah 
Um, so I, I just liked, I liked how that played out. I liked it because I felt like that was kind of the A story. Uh -huh. And uh, well, certainly it gives, it gives, the, gives the episode its title. Um, so I liked right. the way that played out and I liked the way it kept, kept you guessing. And it also showed how different uh, Mariner and Barbara seemed to be at the beginning and yet how uh -huh. alike they actually were. Mm -hmm. and that they actually liked brad for some of the same reasons mm -hmm. and um and yeah i mean that that was that was really cool to see i i enjoyed it i enjoyed it a lot i i liked uh, and i also loved seeing i love seeing characters love for each other yeah it's one of my sure. favorite things in, in in just storytelling in general and so i felt like this whole thing was about how much um how much mariner loves boimler mm -hmm. <laughs> you know yep and also rutherford and tendy like Again, I and actually I have to correct something I said last episode. I, I kind of flipped their relationship, um, and I I, I had uh, uh, Tendy being the one who had gone out of her way to spend time with Rutherford, but Rutherford actually gone out of his way to spend time with Tendy. And mm -hmm. or, was, or did I do that backwards? No, no, you were right this okay. time. All right. So I think I said that backwards last episode, but the, the, the point was still the same that one of them was really into the other and, and the other uh -huh. one didn't quite get it, but they have kind of moved away from that. I definitely saw that in this episode that they're, they're totally just like best friends and buds and everything. But right. I will also say that um, as someone who is, um, you know, this year or, or no next year um, married for 20 years to um, my uh, best friend of the, of the last nearly 30 years, um, I, I would say that uh, whatever you, that, that the, the advice that I always give people is to not look for your romantic partner, you mm -hmm. know, to not look for the one you're going to fall in love with, but just look to make deep friendships because friendship is the foundation of a marriage. If you yeah, don't sure. have that, if the, at the end of the day, you do not have a deep, long lasting friendship, nothing else matters um, because there are going to be days when the romance, there are going to be even long periods when the romance just isn't there mm -hmm. for one reason or another, uh, yeah. be it physiological or, or emotional or stress or, or life or whatever. You're just not in a dating relationship for the majority of your life, for the majority of your life. You're in a, you're in a, a, what needs to be, what has to be a deep abiding friendship. And I think um, friendship is the most important love. And so I think it's cool that we have these two in our cast of, of mm -hmm. our main four. We have these sort of two potential couples and they're both just kind of like best friends. Yeah, and for sure. It's okay for them to stay there, but it would also, it's also cool if they, if they do. But if it becomes a romance, it does come out of that deep friendship, which I think right. is really, like you were saying, that's really key. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's the way that uh, my wife and I are. And that's the way that I think that any really healthy relationship is, is where yeah. it is a friendship. And um, I, I don't know, I, I really liked that, that um, it even ended up in a sort of like uh, friendly, not even friendly rivalry, like they were actively angry at each other, but they were still friends <laughs> by the end, end of the episode. And, right. I thought that was really, really helpful to show that like, it doesn't have to just be like unfailingly lovey-dovey the whole time for you to still be friends with these people, you know? And uh, I thought that was great. It, it, it sort of um, kind of echoes almost the the friendship between uh, David and Jonathan in the Bible. And I know mm. that's that's like, that's the one that everybody goes to to talk about friendship, right? But like, it also, I feel like that does have a really deep meaning to it because they are very close people like mm -hmm. they were very very close friends and um and i think that seeing that sort of friendship to where you would go out of your way like uh like mariner went out of her way to save boimler even though she was wrong uh <laughs> right. sort of went out of her way to to make that happen she jumped across empty space in a space suit like that's, <laughs> that's that's pretty love. incredible yeah that's exactly love. yeah exactly well, even, even when she's acting like at the beginning it's like well she's jealous sure She's clearly jealous and she is. And I think, yeah, you know, that's a very human thing, but uh -huh. also you don't jump out of an airlock because of jealousy. Exactly. She really <laughs> is. She really is trying to protect him. She really right. is like, if, if there's anything, and that was what I loved about it too, was it's such a crisis point. It's like, if there's anything in this world that happens to somebody, it better not happen to Boimler. You know, I'm going to stop that from happening. I'm going to, I'm going to do everything I can to stop that from happening. I mean, that's love. Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. laying down your life for your friends. That's, that's awesome. Yep. Yeah. That's right. So cool. I also want to just toss uh, this. I think this might be the first episode with a C story. I mean, they got rid of the, yeah. of the cold open and then they tossed in a C story. And I yeah. thought that was really fun. The, yes. the, the, 
people who don't want to don't want the moon to be destroyed because and they all have their various reasons right. very classic star trek like people in a conference room dealing with stuff yes uh, and i thought that was fantastic and it's great because in this series we have permission for the captain to just get totally exasperated with the whole thing. right yes yeah <laughs> I, I mean freeman does stuff in there that we wish picard would have done but he was just <laughs> too good of an ambassador to do it and yeah. uh in this one he actually does it or she actually does it rather yeah and uh it's just it, fantastic yeah. yeah you you always wish that picard would have just said just blow up the moon right <laughs> It's 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 so much fun. I, I I really enjoy that about the and and the other thing about the series too that I enjoy is the I think probably the funniest thing to me is usually the nerd jokes. Um, yes, you know. <laughs> oh man, I I kept meaning to go back and I I didn't have time to today. I wanted to go back and freeze frame uh, uh, the uh, the crazy person wall uh, that uh, the mayor yes, put up. Yes, yes, yes. Because I saw the salt creature. Yes, um, and and, and I saw. Uh huh. And I saw a couple of other things on there, and I—I I mean, they they tossed so many references in yeah. already uh, that I just felt like there have got to be some great references on that wall, and I wanted to just freeze frame it and see all of them. Yes, exactly. And then, then also in the dialogue, when like Mariner's listing all these things that she thought uh, <laughs> <laughs> she thought Barb could have been, and right? She's and she she gets all the way to like uh, what is it like the sexy people in the skimpy jumpers who kiss, kill you for walking on the grass, <laughs> right? <laughs> yep. <laughs> Oh, I loved it. <laughs> and honestly, it wouldn't be that crazy for them to just toss in that random species that that tried to kill Wesley Crusher. You know, right. it would it would be perfectly within their uh, their sort of wheelhouse as a show yes. to toss yes. that in there. Yeah, and that's the great thing because Star Trek has always had a lot of like nerd in jokes like in there, but they're kind of subtle. It's uh -huh. great that this series can just hit the gas on that and just be just just go for it. Like where else right. can you where else can you tell real Star Trek jokes? Uh -huh. Except in the Star Trek series, so, like Boimler uh, yeah, saying that. that his girlfriend is as real as a hopped up cue on Cap <laughs> Captain Picard Day. I don't even know what that means, but I love it. <laughs> oh, it's wonderful! It's wonderful. I, I love it. Uh, it's it's. I, I'm enjoying it more and more uh, as as time goes on. The characters are endearing themselves to me more, and um, mm -hmm. it's just like any Star Trek. You know, I've talked to lots of people over the years who tried a new Star Trek series or a Star Trek movie or whatever, and they didn't like it. And I loved it. And I've always just been like, just give it a little more chance. Give it a little mm -hmm. more time. You know, my dad tells a story that uh, when he was growing up, well, and my grandmother told the story too when, when she was alive, but um, that uh, when they were kids, uh, whatever food she served, they had to try a new thing mm -hmm. at least three times. Mm -hmm. And if after three times you didn't like it, you didn't have to eat it ever again. But you yeah. had to try it three times. And yep. I've, I've always held on to that as like, you know, give people a chance, give things a chance, you know, um, mm -hmm. it's really easy at first glance to try to push anything away. Like I tried to do with lower, de lower decks uh -huh. to push anybody or anyone away because when you, when they first come at you, you don't like them or you don't understand them, or maybe they didn't present their best self like lower decks. Mm -hmm. um, but give it another chance, give them another chance. Um, and you might be surprised that you, you might, might just discover that it's like a Kirk Sunday with Trip Tucker Sprinkles. <laughs> that was the best line. <laughs> that was the best line. Last episode, it was the koala line. This one was the <laughs> Kirk Sunday with the Trip Tucker Sprinkles. Yeah, that was, that was great. That's awesome. Yeah. So, or it, you might discover that they, they become a friend, even though you were just trying to, you know, murder them because you thought they were a parasite. Whatever yeah. it is, uh, whatever it is. Um, so awesome. Um, well, you know, uh, David, we've been talking to you or I've been talking to you for a while now. Um, and, and you've been very gracious to just be this anonymous person this whole time we've been talking, <laughs> although people could have taken the time while listening to us to go look you up, which they should. Um, tell us about real world theology, please tell us what it is and where it comes from. Yeah, sure. Uh, so I, uh, yeah, I'm the managing editor at real world theology and our whole purpose is basically what your purpose is, you stated it so beautifully in episode one of this show, uh, where you were talking about what you do with Gospel According to Star Trek. Um, that's basically our purpose, but instead of limiting it to just one series or one uh, show, we talk about it with regard to everything. It started out with movies, but we're bridging out to TV and uh, talking about, you know, books and all video games soon, I think as well. And uh, so we want to talk about all of those things. You know, we think we think that everything that we create and enjoy says something about 
God and who he made us to be and how we react to that. So something about our hearts. Uh, we think that God wrote his story on our hearts. And so when we are uh, reading and watching good, solid narratives that really make us think and that sort of thing, it's because it's echoing or res uh, resonating in some way with the story that God put on our hearts. And so that's been something that I've been really passionate about for about a decade now. And I came on board with Real World Theology uh, about two or three years ago and uh, started working with them on that as well. Worked, well, we started working together, I guess, because I'm part of them now. Uh, but uh, but we've, we've been doing that for a few years now. And um, the reason that I uh, met you is because uh, I reached out to you about doing this uh, several years ago for um, a, a show called a series called Te Trek Timber uh, in September. We started yes. it. Uh, I, I actually started it in 2016 for the 50th anniversary. We did the first season of uh, the original series, um, one episode at a time. It was me, and then I had a, a friend sort of help me out with one of the articles and so and it was a great time had a great uh, a great experience with that it was really well received and then so the next year we decided we wanted to do next generation and i reached out to some more people and you were one of them uh yep. so we uh and i think it was it was really great and and ever since then we've been uh we uh so the first year was original series and then we did next generation the year after that we did discovery in the orville mm -hmm. uh the year after that we did deep space nine and then this year is the the fifth season and uh we've got a little bit of a different uh a little bit of a different thing this year so yeah, and you know what's interesting now. Now, when you talk about those earlier days of um, Trek Timber, if people go digging for those, mm -hmm. those were actually on Redeeming Culture. That's right. Yep. Is that, and, is that still a thing? Is that uh, it is? It, it's still active, though. Uh, though it's sort of it's still uh, online. I should say it's not not active anymore, but it's still on there. Uh, basically, everything that I was doing on Redeeming Culture, I'm doing it on Real World Theology now. But I do have the original. Uh, Trek Timbers linked from the page at realworldtheology.com okay. uh, where, and actually the easiest way to get to that is if you just go to trektember.com, T-R-E-K, Timber, T-E-M-B-E-R.com. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, it'll just send you straight to the page where you can see all of the articles of Trek Timber that are currently out. Um, so uh, everything from seasons one through four and then what's out for season five so far. That's fantastic. Now, um, the other thing that, that I've done with you um, last year Mm -hmm. was uh, I got to write an article on an episode of Star Trek Picard because you guys were going episode by episode through the first season of Picard and blogging about the episodes as they dropped. Yep. Yeah, that's so, something that we started with Picard and that we're going to continue through Lower Decks as well. And I think we might even do Discovery this year, just depending. Um, I mean, you know, uh, it wasn't this way with Picard, but now <laughs> the pandemic's happened and there's no movies coming out. So we got to do something, right? Yeah. Uh, so, uh, so yeah, uh, we had a great time with Picard. I really appreciated your article and your insights on, on that show. And, uh, and yeah, so that, that's not s sort of uh, officially sort of part of Trek Timber. But I mean, you know, the Star Trek landscape, like we talked about earlier, the Star Trek landscape has changed significantly since we started. I mean, when I started Trek Timber, we didn't have any Star Trek shows on the air. Uh, Beyond had just come out. There was um, a little bit... Uh, that well, they had announced Discovery, but I don't even I don't even remember if there had been casting information yet. Uh, but uh, we didn't have a whole lot going on uh, back then, and so Trek Timber was an attempt to sort of fill that gap and fill the rift uh, where there was nothing there. But now, you know, we've got Picard and Lower Decks and Discovery, um, and they're working on Section Thirty One and Prodigy and Strange New Worlds. And I've even heard rumors of a Captain Proton revival and a fourth Kelvin universe <laughs> film. Yeah. Uh, and I'm still holding out hope for a, um, a show about Seven of Nine in, as a Finner's Ranger. And, oh, right, uh, right. And I want to see a show about her uh, and being pursued by Admiral Janeway, but like she's like secretly helping her. I, I feel like that would be a great dynamic and a really mm. fun show. I'm, I'm just, I keep, I, I want to keep saying it just to sort of like, you know, speak that into the world and hopefully it'll happen. <laughs> um, maybe somebody from CBS is listening. Give Jerry Ryan a show about her time as a, a seventh time as a fitness ranger. I think that would be great. All right. So, so David, are you are you coming on? Are you coming on a a, a gospel according to Star Trek podcast and plugging the secret? <laughs> <laughs> Not on purpose. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
<laughs> hey, stranger things have happened. People had hey, yeah, clamored agree. for a Pike show with Anson Mount, and it's happening now. Oh, I know. So. I, it's it's great. I'm so excited about it. That's mm-hmm. that's. Uh, They're yeah. releasing the Snyder cut of the Justice League. I mean, come on. There, there's going to be no living with nerds after this. I'm just trying to ride that wave. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. I was with you right up to the Snyder cut part, but that's okay. It's fine. <laughs> hey, I, I'm not passing judgment on the the quality of it or anything like that. I'm just saying they clamored for it and they and did they it. Got it. And that's true. so there like that's, that's there you go. I see what you're saying. I understand. Yeah. yeah, no, you're right. And that's and that's the great thing about about again about being a Star Trek fan right now. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, your voice is heard more than it used to be. Yeah. For sure. And, you know, we were talking, I think, last episode about um, how there's all this kind of behind the scenes chaos that everybody's talking about and getting all worried about and kind of wringing their hands about mm-hmm. uh, in certain in certain corners of the world. But that's the kind of stuff that has always gone on behind the scenes. It's just right. That we didn't get to peek behind the curtain back then. Right. Um, we're, we're just more aware of what's going on in production than we used to be. And, you know, there's nothing inherently wrong with that, but people have to not get distracted by it. And right. But it also can involve fans more in the creation of, uh, of a property like Star Trek. Mm-hmm. Um, we can see fan influence from season one to season two of Discovery, though I think a certain amount of that was already planned. Um, yeah. You know, a certain amount of it also was, was kind of response to fan reactions to the first season which I loved, but still, um, <laughs> um, but you, you know, you see that conversation happening in more in, in real time. So it, it, it pays right now, I think, to not walk away, yeah. to not turn the TV off because you don't like what you see, but to stay mm-hmm. engaged and to use your voice and to talk about right? it and to see what other people are saying. I mean, back in 1967 or 68, I don't remember, it took Bijo Trimble, like it was her full-time job trying to get people to write in to save Star Trek so that it would right. have a third season. That's right. And, and that's, that, that is so much easier now. There's so much less in the way of you making your voice heard to CBS right now. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and I think, I hope that that's the sort of thing that Trek fans really take to heart, that like we have a voice here and, uh, and there's just so much going on and it's such a profitable thing. And there's so much that they're willing to do. I mean, they're making a Nickelodeon show for crying out loud. Like that's, that's way out of the box. Uh, I feel like they're willing to try just about anything. And so, uh, you know, toss out the good ideas and maybe it'll get picked up. Yeah, that's good. So Admiral Janeway chasing, chasing after Annika. Yeah. Yeah. That's good. I think it's great. Yeah. So you guys, so the, the lower decks thing is kind of dovetailing with Trek Temper, right? Yeah. Yeah. So I'm, I'm sort of including it just because it's, it's so much Trek content. Right. And, uh, Mm -hmm. but this year, so in years past, we've been doing, you know, episodes every day or at least every weekday, um, especially the first two, uh, or the first season we were talking about every episode of, uh, a season. And then the, uh, when we were talking about discovery in the Orville discovery's first season, uh, we were talking about every episode of that as well. Uh, this year I wanted to take a step back because we were, you know, back then we were publishing shorter articles. We were publishing, uh, every day, I wanted to take a step back because it is such a different landscape right now. And Star Trek is so much broader and sort of the future is so much, the horizon is so much broader than we had uh, even just last year, but definitely four years ago. So uh, our this year, instead of focusing on one show or one season of a show, uh, we wanted to go through a, um, go more broad with it. Uh, just like the, the show, this franchise as a whole is going. Um, so uh, we are still doing episodic reviews, like you mentioned, of Lower Decks, but for our Trek Timber sort of uh, regulation Trek Timber episodes, <laughs> we're going to be going into a greater depth and breadth about the Star Trek universe. Um, and we've, we've chosen a, uh, a theme, <laughs> which is right. new life, new civilizations. Uh, that's famously a part of the 37 eternal words uh, which exp- explain the premise of Star Trek in every episode of the original series and also every episode of uh, Next Generation. And uh, let's see, I think it was a, the lo- final episode of Enterprise, and it's probably been said one or two other times. Uh, oh, uh, Star Trek 2009 is the oath of the Starfleet captain. And yeah, it's all over the place in Star Trek, right? But um, we wanted to focus on new life and new civilizations because there are a lot of, there's a lot of meaning in those words, right? The, yeah. the new life, meaning what Christ purchased for us on the cross, the new civilization being the coming kingdom of God, the kingdom of God that is here that we're a part of already. Uh, and, and just the way that those both are 
uh, echoed in Star Trek, the way that those are both uh, portrayed in Star Trek, I think it's a really fascinating thing that the famous atheist Gene Roddenberry gave us what is probably the most beautiful portrayal of a possible heaven that I've ever seen. Mm -hmm. uh, his, his, his future 24th century uh, federation is, is the closest thing to a, a heaven location that we sort of have in, pop, in mainstream popular culture. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's no, there's no want, there's no, there's no hunger, there's no need. Everybody is cared for and everybody is, is valued as a human at, or non-human, whatever the mm -hmm. case may be. Right. Uh, everyone has got a purpose. You know, people on Starfleet ships have a purpose. They have a, a thing to explore. Uh, and I've said for a couple of years now, you know, I don't think, I don't think heaven is going to be like harps in the clouds, like the uh, Looney Tunes cartoons show. I think it'll be more like Star Trek, where we're together as a people and we're exploring the depths of God and who he is and what he does. Um, and, and I don't know that that's going to take place on a starship. L don't, right. <laughs> to, just to be clear, <laughs> I don't think we're going to be shooting phasers at Romulans or anything like that. But I do think that there's going to be a distinct amount of exploration. And we're going to be finding out more of who God is. And I think that's what Star Trek is doing. They're finding ways to explore God through that. Um, and so I think that's part of what the new life and new civilization really means. It's more about exploring God and less about trying to just find new ways to entertain or amuse yourself or pass the time for all of eternity. It's about being a part of a new life, a new civilization in your new life. Uh, and I, I, that's, that's all just sort of part and parcel with what we're trying to do this year. So uh, the first article went up um, on, well, by the time this comes out last week, uh, last Thursday, and it was an article by your friend and mine, Mike Petit, and he was talking yes. about holy books within Star Trek, the original series. Uh, and I thought it was, it was just a fantastic article. Um, it was talking about, um, uh, for the world is hollow and I have touched the sky and the Omega glory and a piece of the action. And there are sort of holy books, the way that they have changed their civilizations, the way that the, the new life, um, how Kirk brought new life into all of those things and how the new civilizations uh, of, those, uh, of those three worlds were affected and shaped by the book. And, um, yeah. and he, he did a really great job. And I, I really encourage everyone to go to tricktember.com. Take a look at that. that it, it's just, it's a fantastic article. And I definitely recommend it. Well, you know, and I recommend anything Mike writes and, and you know, especially <laughs> things like that, which the moment I hear it, I think, why didn't I think to write that? It's <laughs> so good. It is. It's uh, fantastic. Such a great, you know, such, such a great uh, angle. And, and Mike is, um, Mike is just, uh, you know, uh, he's he's a good friend and and uh, has been involved with the whole gospel according to star trek thing behind the scenes you know helping me out um over the years and um and and yeah great writer and you've got a lot of really good writers um contributing to trek timber and mm -hmm. uh, i just i just enjoy the the whole exploration and i love that you know you're taking it in in new directions doing new things with it and uh, i think it's great to be flexible with your model and that you're going into some longer pieces especially as someone who tends to write longer pieces. Um. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm not going to lie. That was a not insignificant part of my decision was oh, that I, 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 uh, I kept getting such great articles and I'm like, sorry, Kevin, it's just too long. Uh, <laughs> oh, shucks, sir. I'll, I'll, I'm just glad I got you on record saying that. That's all. I have to say <laughs> that. Oh man. I said too much. I know. <laughs> oh, yeah, and I, I tell you what, I do I do plug that article on Nepenthe and, and some other things that I've written for you here and there because yeah, fantastic. Because what I really appreciate about stuff like you're doing is it gives me a chance to write, you know, with a prompt that I never otherwise would have had. Mm -hmm. And uh and, and I, I sometimes stumble upon things and it draws things out of me that I never would have otherwise discovered. So uh, anytime I get a chance to write for something like that, I always try to make it happen. So um, I appreciate it. Yeah. And, and I mean, you're mostly, it seems like writing longer form stuff in the form of books and, and long, yeah. longer talks. And I think what we're trying to do through September is just give people a little bit of a bite. Uh, you know, this is a, a little bit of a thing. You're just like, you're watching one episode. Here's a little bit of a, maybe meditation is too Christian-y of a word for this, but mm -hmm. here's a little bit of a meditation on this episode, just so that you're not, our, our tagline on real world theology is entertainment is not mindless. Yeah. So engage your mind with this episode, or in this case of Mike's article, three episodes of Star Trek, you know, engage your mind. What does this say about 
God and how he's made us and who he's made us to be, how he's made us to react to texts. Uh, and I, I think that that's really helpful. Um, and, you know, real world theology isn't just trick temper. There's more than that. If you like this model and you really think that this is valuable ways of, these are valuable ways of interacting with culture. I mean, I will grant you almost all of the episodes are, or uh, articles on our front page are Star Trek right now, but there is an article on Mad Max, uh, Mad hey, Max Fury hey. Road on the front, front page. Uh, awesome. So, there's, there's more stuff than just that. And, and we think that this is a really valuable way of, of talking about the world and our place in it, uh, because there is so much of what we ourselves are imbued within the culture that we create and the stories that we tell. That's awesome, sir. Man, I, uh, it's, it's great to see you guys out there doing this and not just for Trek Timber, but for all of what you're doing at, at Real World Theology, because like Tim and I have, have talked about more than once, it's never a forced conversation. It's never a, it's never a, a, an attempt to fit something that you're watching or something that you're, you're listening to into some kind of shell, mm -hmm. into some kind of mold that it doesn't, that it doesn't jive with. You're, you're just, as a Christian, with your Christian worldview lunges on, responding honestly to what you see and how it connects with the things that matter to you most. Yeah, and, for sure. And, and doing that in an honest way, and that's that's why it's great that we can, you know, uh, you know, we can we can have those deeper, richer conversations in the context of general nerdy conversations, um, <laughs> which is what we, uh, you know, the 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 kind of angle that that we take over here. But um, you know, I feel a lot of kinship with what you guys are doing, um, both on real world theology in general and in Trek Timber. Um, not only because I'm the guy who started a thing called <laughs> Spocktober, which I ran right. for several years, um, <clears throat> but yeah, uh, that that's a good name too. Uh, oh, yeah, no, much. we we really va value what you're doing uh, at Gospel According to Star Trek too, it, and um, I really value the the thought and the depth that you bring to this. Uh, endeavor and hey uh, the more people that are doing this with culture i think the more that we can sort of normalize that way of looking at our stories um, i think the better i think it just makes us a stronger people and uh, more engaged with uh with who god is i agree and you know even if you're not a christian or even if you're not a nerd <laughs> um, i think i think it's great from either angle to engage with this stuff mm -hmm. because number one um if you are a christian it, it helps you no matter who you are i think it can help you think more deeply about mm -hmm. what you what you engage with in your life and what you love and why you love it for sure and for then sure. also i think when when we're doing that through the arts and through media and pop culture we can that's always a doorway into how we deal with other human beings Mm -hmm. And that's, that's what Star Trek, you know, has always been about, um, about transforming the way that we deal with one another as human beings by telling good stories um, that model those things for us and in yeah. ways that come at us that, that we might not expect. And yep. so I, I think, I think that's, uh, I think that's great. So uh, as we're about to come to the end of the uh, show here and I, I like to do a little Q and a section at the end of the, at the end of the episode as often as we can get it in. And mm -hmm. you actually have a cue for me to a, so I, do. I would love to, I would love to hear your cue. Not, not a, um, a, a, um, a petty uh, godlike being, but an actual question. <laughs> I, I would love to well, hear. Well, the answer might actually be cute. Okay. So here's the question. <laughs> uh, in, in, at the end of discovery season two, they go 700 years in the future. So, presumably at least part of Discovery Season 3 is going to be set very far distant future from everything we've seen before. The right. question is, what very long-lived character from past Star Trek episodes would you like to see showing up in Discovery Season 3? I'm trying to think of a character that actually lives that long. I mean, yeah, <laughs> Q would be a good answer. Mm -hmm. uh, Q would be an excellent answer. Um, but I don't know that Q fits tonally in discovery at all yeah um but it would be interesting to see people reacting to q because it literally would be like hey you really don't belong here like this isn't how we do things dude mm -hmm. you know we don't do <laughs> we don't do tongue-in-cheek humor like right you know it's so funny because we talked about the term tongue-in-cheek on the last episode but uh -huh. like, we don't <laughs> we don't do that you know like you need to you need to uh you know get on with yourself um so that that would be interesting. I'm trying to think of any other characters like that are really long lived. Um, well, you know, so we I, I, we were just talking about one of the new uh, one of the new cast members is, is going to be a trill, uh, right? And so I a, believe I believe Dax is long lived. Yes. Yeah. So could it possibly be Gray Dax? Mm. Ooh. Ooh. 
Ooh. You know, you know that, but but now that we think about it, and I'm and I'm thinking about long lived characters. Uh huh. You know who I've always wanted to go back to visit, and who I was really disappointed that we didn't go back to visit. Kai Opaka. Ooh, I like that because Kai yeah. Opaka from Deep Space Nine. Spoiler uh-huh. alert. Kai Opaka is stranded on that planet where nobody dies. Right. Yep. Yep. She did definitely still be alive, and assuming that planet's her, still there. Right. And her mission is to like save that culture. Uh huh. So in 700 years, what progress has she made? Oh, man. She's taken over the Gamma Quadrant, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> but I just, I just, I think that would be fan. I would think that would be fascinating and fantastic. Yeah. I would love that. Yeah. I think that would be great. Yeah. I hadn't even thought about her. Uh, I would love to see. So the, uh, but when uh, when 700 years was first sort of thrown out, um, yeah. some people online did the math and figured out that this lines up, uh, season three of Discovery, presumably, lines up almost perfectly with the timeline of Living Witness, the episode from Voyager, where the doctor's backup emitter or backup program, backup unit module, whatever, is left on a planet in the Delta Quadrant. And he sort of enjoys the uh, or uh, he corrects the the um, misconceptions that the people of this planet have about voyager they think it's the warship voyager oh, right yeah and yeah. and uh he corrects their their sort of flawed interpretation of everything and participates in this revolution uh and um and eventually it it says he decides that he wants to go home and so he loads up a ship and heads home at the very end of the episode mm-hmm. uh, or they talk about him having headed home rather right. and um somebody did the math and figured out that that's basically about 700 years from i air quotes now but when discovery leaves uh the the their timeline and right. given the vagaries and the the sort of abouts that are uh, involved in the timeline here Mm -hmm. it is very possible that you could see voyager's doctor showing up coming back to the federation (laughs) in uh season three of discovery and i think that would be fantastic i'd love to see bob picardo back on screen um and or i mean somebody else i don't know i don't want to recast i want to see i want to see robert picardo you know you can you you can talk about how he modified his program to make it look like he aged or something like that because uh i want to definitely see him back yeah i mean you recasting bob picardo is 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 as uh, impossible as recasting um uh brent spiner i mean you you just Mm -hmm. don't do it you just right right for sure you don't care that they've gotten older and really honestly bob has always looked a little older than he actually was so hey you know <laughs> right yeah <laughs> much like patrick stewart he is yes. only now caught up with the age that he's always looked <laughs> <laughs> something like that something like that <laughs> oh man well that's great no I, I i think that's great i that's that's the the first question we've gotten that wasn't that wasn't directly rooted in some you know some conversation between star trek and and, and christianity so um thanks for that i guess well, i felt like we had a lot of jesus's in the we uh, did. previous con- conversation we did. So. <laughs> Oh boy, that's great. Well, um, no, I appreciate you doing that. that. That's exciting. And I'm, I'm just, I'm excited about the future of Star Trek. I'm excited about Trek Timber. I'm excited to be involved with it. Uh, when, when my post comes out, I'm, I'm sure everybody's going to hear about it on the <laughs> podcast because, you know. You're the doesn't. king of shameless plugs. I am. You know what? I, <laughs> I appreciate that. I, <laughs> I work on that. So, um, David, thank you so much for being here. I've appreciated your presence greatly. Thank you for having me. And uh, next week, we're going to cover episode six of Lower Decks, and we'll be returning to our discussion of Star Trek Discovery, and I hope you'll join us. In the meantime, please like, share, comment, rate, and subscribe. And if you're on YouTube, be sure to ring that bell. And also send us your questions, uh, like, uh, like David just did. Gospel According to Star Trek on Twitter and Facebook, or Gospel Trek Podcast at gmail.com. We would love to discuss your questions on the show. So that's going to wrap it for this edition of the Gospel According to Star Trek Podcast. My thanks again to our guest, David Atwell. The website is trektember.com or realworldtheology.com. Links are in the description. Please go check that out. And my thanks to you. Yes, you. Thank you so much for being here. And until next time, I'm Kevin C. Nice, and as Jesus said in John 10.10, live long and prosper. And Tim, I'll see you next time. <laughs>